Hey everybody, welcome to the first in a series of videos uh, on how I set up and fly the A320 in the Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, it's going to be a series broken into a couple stages. Uh, the first uh, part will be my setup and aircraft preparation. The second video will be pushback, engine start and taxi. Third will be takeoff. Uh, and the cruise. The fourth uh, will be descent and landing. And uh, five will be taxi and shut down. Uh, I'm going to run through it the way I do it. It may not be 100% correct. I will try to answer what everything does uh, to give you an idea and uh, the sequence I do it in. But uh, this is just mine. It is by no means uh, how to fly the real aircraft. It is just based on my experience, my personal knowledge, and how I do things. And I am using a few mods for this one. The first one is the Fly-By-Wire A320NX mod. Uh, it is version 5.2 stable. That is the one I'll use for this tutorial. I'm also using a couple other things. Uh, one of them is Navigraph Charts. I am using SimBrief for my flight planning. I am using uh, Pushback Express for my pushback and my baggage and the voices you'll hear regarding the ground crew uh, outside the aircraft. And I'm also using uh, PAX, P-A-C, X, which is passenger and crew experience and they are doing the cabin uh, announcements and cabin crew duties as you will hear them as we go along. Um, I do not uh, use really any other mods um, except for aircraft and liveries our aircraft liveries and airports. Uh, this flight will be done without the in-game ATC and without anything like VATSIM just to keep it basic uh, at this level. So you can see we are here at the uh, airport. This is an add-on airport. We are in Edinburgh here at the gates and uh, you can see the airport here. This is a freeware airport from flightsim.to all these links will be included down in the description. And we have the, oh, there's those terrain spikes off in the distance. Uh, we have custom scenery at Glasgow where we're heading into as well. And that is also going to be linked down below. So let's get on board the aircraft and we'll get started. So the first thing you're going to see when you come into the airplane when you load in, if you load in cold and dark, will be the aircraft sitting in this state. Basically it is completely powered off and it is not connected to anything. This is not the way I start the aircraft in the videos. Uh, the way I do it is under the understanding that the ground crew and the, and the ramp guys would have brought the aircraft over, plugged it into power, hooked up the jetway and uh, left the external power connected to warm, start warming up the inside of the airplane. So what we're going to do is we are going to run through the procedures and the checklist that I have that we would follow and as I said I'll explain things as we go. So once you come in what I would do is go up to the overhead panel here as you can see it and I'm going to pull up I'm gonna, I usually don't use these, but I'm going to pull these up just so it's easier to see what we're looking at. So this is the overhead panel. This is the top of it. And I'll, I'll run down before we start what we're looking at. So on the back top of the panel, we have our, our circuit breakers. They're all located here in the center. We have our ELT, which is our emergency locator transmitter. It's If we go down, it sends out the signal saying... Um, hey this is where we are. Cockpit door controls for locking the cabin door. There's a reading light here. Uh, if we go over onto this side we've got the oxygen 
uh, stuff, some hydraulics and APU monitoring. Uh, another reading light down uh, here for the first officer. Um, some audio switching and some other instrumentation. We don't really go up to this panel inside the sim. Now if we go to the lower panel, uh, we do use this one. And this has a number of things we're going to need, and I'll run it as we would do like a quick flow check, which is left to right, top to bottom, by section. So here we have what's called the ADIRs. They are our navigation system. There's three of them. They work in concert for cross-referencing and verification. They're currently all turned off. They have a nav position. I'm not sure what ATT stands for, but we'll see them in action in a minute. Down below, we have flight computers. Um, flight controls, uh, elevator control, stabilizer control, um, I'm not sure what the other one is. We rarely ever touch them. In fact, you should never really touch them. You don't want to be turning those computers off. Moving down, we have some other uh, things like the evacuation commands and emergency electrical power and generators. Under that is the GPWS, uh, ground proximity and wind shear. Uh, systems, so they're all alert systems. Uh, there's uh, some other things. There's the oxygen systems, call buttons. That's for calling outside. Uh, the mech is for outside down to the um, ground crew when they plug in. The all button goes to everywhere, and then you got two in the cabin, a forward and an aft. There's also an emergency. There's a rain repellent for bad storms, and then your wipers. Moving up to the center panel at the top, we have your fire test switches oops, and uh, activation system. Under that, you've got your hydraulic fuel system. So you can see your green, your blue, and your yellow systems and your engines uh, for your pumps and stuff. At the moment, we don't do anything with that within the sim. Below that, you have your fuel pumps. These are your fuel pumps for your main fuel tanks. We do use those. Under that comes your electrics, so your generators, your battery switches, your APU generator, your electrical uh, external power tie-in, which is right here. We use that as well. Coming down from there, we have your air in the back, so your uh, packs, your air conditioning, your temperature controls, and all that type of stuff. Under that, we have our anti-ice, which we do use, probe heats, cabin pressure, which we don't. It's not modeled currently. And then under this at the bottom, we have our lights, our main lights, and then in the center, the APU start switches. And over from there, we got some more lights and seatbelt signs and stuff like that. So moving on again over to this side, we've got a little bit of the radio switches from above. Then we come down here, the first officer's uh, con computer control switches. And then there's some stuff about the cargo systems and the fire systems, ventilation systems and stuff like that. And then his wiper controls that are located here. So if we move down to the front of the aircraft, across the top here we have uh, basically the autopilot system, flight management computer, it's all in there. Down here we have the displays, the main displays, the navigation displays, the plant primary flight displays, the ECAM displays. And then on the bottom pedestal, just very quickly, we have the two computers where data is entered into, the main computer control switching. Uh, we have the navigation and comms radios on either side of the throttles, throttles in the center, trim wheels on either side. Moving down, we've got light controls, the weather radar under here. If we go to the other side, we have the, uh, the transponder on this side. Then we come down here, the speed brake and the flaps, cockpit door lock, uh, the printer for the uh, little computer printer here, parking brake, emergency gear extension, uh, uh, I think the rudder trim and the horizontal trims right at the back. And then there's the door lock switch, which is right under the, uh, uh, right in front of the, the seat here, right here. So that's basically it. We have the side stick controls. There's one here and one on the other side. And that's the cockpit. So the first thing we want to do once you come in is again, we're going to go up top. We're going to click on the uh, green button here. It says 
external power and available. So we'll go back over to that one. There we go. You can see it says external power and available. So we're going to click on that. Sorry, my mouse isn't showing up in the proper places compared to what I see and what you're seeing. So I've got to move it around. So you can hear everything is fired up. We now have power inside the airplane. What I would then do is turn on the nav lights, uh, which is right uh, there. And that puts on the outer red and green marker lights on the aircraft. And then I would go up and activate the ground services and say, hey, can you hook up the jetway for us, please? And they will do that. I also have the voices for all the ground services and stuff turned off. And what that leaves you with is this. The aircraft is ready to go. The marker lights, nav lights are on. And you have the jet bridge coming in and connecting. And this is typically how you would see the aircraft sitting at the gate when you approach it from the inside. Powered up, kind of ready to go. So I have a checklist that I use when I go through the aircraft. And uh, I would recommend going online, finding a checklist you like and using. Um, there, there's a variety of them out there. Some of them are slightly different from each other. It's not a really big deal. The main thing is to hit the important points as you go through what you have to do. So the first thing you got to do is get your um, flight plan. Now I use SimBrief and SimBrief allows me to plan out my route, my fuel, my, lo my loads and all that type of stuff. So what I'm going to do is I am going to bring up my SimBrief right now and we will uh, take a look at it. So here it is. This is, I've entered in the information and had to generate a flight plan for today's flight. So it is in the EasyJet format, which I find easy to read and it has all the information I need in one spot. So you can see here's my airline flight. Uh, it has my, my flight number right here, uh, or the airline flight number, aircraft type, call sign, where we're originating from, EGPH, which is Edinburgh. Where we're going, EGKK, Gatwick Airport. Our alternate, our cruise level, flight level 370, which is 37,000 feet. The date, the time of departure, air time, block time. Air time is from takeoff to touchdown. Block time is gate to gate, so an hour and a half block time. How much fuel we're gonna need, our zero fuel weight which means how much we weigh when we're empty and our takeoff weight how much we're going to weigh when we take off our routing information and any remarks uh, if we go down a couple other points about formatting on the flight plan it will show a diagram of your route so here you can see we're taking off from EGPH it shows the route we're going to take down England come down here it shows our destination airport of EGKK and it is selected uh, just outside Paris for our alternate if we can't get into London due to fog or weather or they close the airport or whatever and it shows the alternate flight plan uh, path as well. So moving down from there we now come into the data we're going to need. Now this has got a lot of information here on waypoints and fuel loads and the location of a lot of uh, waypoints uh, on where they are on earth, weather information, airport information, uh, information about all the airports we're going to, current updates. You can read it. We don't really need it for what we're doing. The section we need is what's uh, on the screen right now. And it has all the information. As you'll see, our uh, payload weights are zero fuel weights, the fuel, the takeoff weight, uh, how much fuel we're going to use on the actual trip. Uh, there's our routing information and uh, some other stuff. So I'll show you what we need for setting up the airplane as we go. So that's the flight plan. They were also going to need to know uh, where we're going to be going on the airfield. First thing is where are we right now? So I use Navigraph charts. I find them um, 
very handy. They give me the information I need, not only airport diagrams and information, but also approaches and departures and all that type of stuff. So if we pull up the charts for the airport, we have, there we go. Here's where we are. This is Edinburgh Airport. It, the, it shows where our aircraft is currently. Uh, because I'm running my Navigraph on the same computer, I'm running the simulator. It is showing me um, where I am on the charts. Not all charts, but for most charts. So this is very handy, especially when taxiing around bigger airports with confusing taxiways. So this shows us that we are here at the terminal, shows the gate, and where we have to go. Today's flight is taking off on runway 06, so we are going to have to taxi down and get down to the runway 06. If we were using ATC, the ground controllers would be giving us taxi instructions in this case. Probably something about, uh, you know, taxi, Foxtrot, Echo, Echo 1, Alpha to uh, hold short Alpha 1. If you don't have charts showing this, you're going to be confused about where you're going. Uh, so not only can you see where you're going, it also tracks where you are and helps with what you are doing. And there's other charts that will come up as we go. So that's everything we're going to need at the moment. So we know where we are, we know where we're going. Time to start getting the aircraft ready. So my sequence of events is like this. So check the parking brake is set. So we're going to look down, make sure the parking brake is set. Parking brake is located right here. And yes, it is set. Just give me a second. I'm just going to make another screen a little bit bigger so I can see it better. There we go. So the parking brake is set and it is confirmed. Chocks, they've been removed outside, that's fine, not having to worry about it. Ground power unit, is it connected? Well, it is connected because you can see here we are on external power, so that is not an issue. Throttle levers are at idle. We can look down and see that the throttle levers are back at the idle detent. Engine masters are off. These are the engine masters here. They provide fuel to the engines and, and start them up. They are in the off position, and I also checked that my ignition switch is in the normal position. It's not on ignition and it's not on crank. Next up is the batteries. So we're going to come up here. The battery switches are located right here. They are the two white switches. Uh, white means off in the Airbus. So you, their batteries are currently off. So when we turn them on, not only will they charge, but they'll also help provide power and it, uh, they have to be on for when you're operating the aircraft. So we'll turn the batteries on. There we go. If we weren't plugged into ground power, the aircraft would start up at that point and then you're pulling on your batteries and you don't want to be doing that for too long. Generator switches are on. Now the generator switches are the yellow ones here and here. They are showing fault. Now the reason they are showing fault is, as you can see uh, here and here, they're showing fault because the engines are not running. If we turn them off, they're off. But they're usually left on. They'll just fault when the engine's not running and when the engine fires up, when it gets to the point it can pull off the generators, they'll just turn on. So that is fine. External power, we have confirmed it is on. That is not an issue. Now the adheres. So this is where we start aligning the system on the aircraft for navigation. So we're going to go over here, turn each one to nav in order, one, two, and three. You saw them flash slightly there. Now they're going to take some time to get up and going. In fact, if we look down here on the center panel, it says IR in alignment in seven minutes. So it takes time and you cannot move the aircraft while you're doing this. It's got to sit where it is and uh, get itself all nicely aligned. So the next thing we do is we're going to go to our panels and we're going to turn up the lights because they are turned down a little dim. So all along here we've got little switches. Hope you can see them turning up here. And I turn them up to about one o'clock on the dials. So these two control these two. And I, using the outer knob on this one, 
I turn down my weather radar to about half just so it's not flooding the screen with data. Um, I find that a little bit hard to read on the nav display. So underneath the FMC there's two dials here and here. We're going to turn those up to turn up the lights on that. Then we'll come over, we'll turn up the first officers and I leave his weather radar full just so I can see it from across the way. Down here on the pedestal is the two switches for the lights for the two ECAMs. We'll turn those up. I then go to the MCDUs here and here and there's a little switch there and there to turn up the brightness so I'll do that as well. Click it a few times, notch up the brightness. We'll then come down a little bit further. The pedestal uh, lights are here so they come up Oop. There we go. And then what I also do, the two switches here and here are the upper and lower floodlights. I just give it one click each just to add a little bit more light for when we're in shadow and stuff like that. So that is all the lights up. You can see the cockpit's now nicely illuminated. If it was nighttime and it was dark, what I would do is go to the overhead panel and right here you'll see uh, interior light dome. I would turn that on and if I go that's dim and then there's a bright mode. Just helps at night when you're setting up the cockpit uh, in the dark but I would always turn that off before I taxi to let my eyes adjust to the darkness outside. Last light we do on the overhead panel is right beside there right there and that is the overhead panel and you can see how it just brightens everything up so you can see everything a little bit better. Alright, so the lights are up. Now we start doing some other checks. Landing gear lever, which is located right there, is to confirm down. We look down here. Flaps are confirmed up. Spoilers are confirmed retracted. We take a look at our fuel quantity, which is displayed right here. And it is approximately what we are looking for. So that is good. And then seatbelt signs and no smoking signs. Although in this case it's the no portable devices sign are located up here, right there, seat belts, and then the old no smoking sign is there. So we'll turn them on. There we go. And if we come back down, we can now see that the seat belt sign and the no portable devices are on. So it's at this point we can tell the crew that they can start boarding the passengers. So we will do that. Come on on. Uh, Passengers. That's my little connection software. Didn't quite load up in time, so we'll get them going in a second. So at this point, we're going to go check the weather, and we're going to start getting the aircraft uh, set up for navigation. And we, there's a few things we have to enter in there. So there's the people getting aboard in the back. Again, that is courtesy of PAX which is what I use for all my sounds in the back. So, we're going to head down now to the MCDU and start getting ourselves set up here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to load our flight plan into the aircraft. So we're going to go to our initialization page and I have the aircraft linked to my SimBrief account, which means I will go directly and pull today's flight plan into the aircraft. So I'm going to uh, request my flight plan here on the request page. And it's pulling in my flight plan, and there we go. So you can see here on our from and to, uh, EGPH, which is Edinburgh, EGKK, which is Gatwick. Sorry about that, I had a bit of a cough. Our alternate is, is listed in here, um, LFPO. Underneath that is our flight number, UKV5556. Underneath that is our cost index for the virtual airline I fly, it's always 25, so I'll leave it at that. Cost index is a 
uh, engine efficiency uh, type of number. You'll go a little bit slower, burn less fuel if you want to save money, or go a little bit faster if you're trying to speed up to make up lost time, stuff like that. Cruise flight level, you can see it says flight level 370, and the temp estimated temperature at that flight level is minus 52. Sim brief had minus 55, so that's pretty good. We'll leave it where it is. And what we can do now is we'll go to IRS initialization. Here's the data on the IRS is where they think they are uh, according to the GPS. So align on reference over here. We're just going to click that and then confirm the alignment. And there we go. So those are aligned as the Adiras continue to Hello, do their thing. Gentlemen, I would love to welcome you aboard our flight. When you find your so now we're going to go to the MCDU menu. At Sue. And smaller items underneath the seat OAC. In Unless you're in the front row, please. We're going to go to weather request, and it puts in our our departing and, and arriving airports. So that's everything we need. We can also change the weather type to forecast or actual Once weather currently. Away, we'll go with the current weather. And we'll hit send. Well. So you see it said queued and then sent, so we're waiting for a message to come back from our company operations guys to give us the weather. So we'll go back to the AOC menu, and when the message comes back, there it is, you'll see it says company message right there. So back down we go, we'll go to received messages, and click there's our message, we'll click on that one, and here is our weather. So this is good to know. Uh, the only one that's really critical on this one is our uh, uh, barometer uh, setting, which we'll get to. So the METAR for here at Edinburgh, it at uh, on the 30th of January at 2220 uh, Universal Time, so that's 50 minutes ago, five zero minutes ago. It says the winds are zero six zero at seven knots. So from 60 degrees, which is just north of east, they're coming in at seven knots. Uh, we have broken clouds at 2,600 feet. Those are in hundreds. We have broken clouds at 4,100 feet. So there's two layers of broken clouds. Our temperature is two degrees. The dew point is one degree, which means the closer the dew point and the temperature are, the more likely you are to have fog. Um, so if there's a wide spread in dew point and temperature, the clouds are going to be higher up, but they get closer to the ground as it gets closer to the same thing. And our Q and H is 1009. That is our barometer pressure, and that is the one we're going to need. We can take a quick look at the forecast at Gatwick at the moment. It is uh, at the same time, winds are 060 at 14 knots, so they're about the same direction, we are but ready to go when you are. but twice as strong. And they have broken clouds at 1300 feet. Uh, it's a little bit warmer at four degrees, and their pressure is slightly lower. So there's the weather. It is all good. So what I'm going to do now is go up here to our standby altimeter. We'll turn the light up and I'm going to put in, if we look down, a 1009. We'll scroll that down to 1009 and there is our pressure. So we'll be able to refer to that when we're off this screen when we're setting up the other main uh, altimeters. So we can go back to finishing setting up the aircraft. So initialization page A, which is this one is done, we're now going to go over to page B. And this is where we have to enter some information. So we have here the zero fuel weight. You can see the boxes waiting for this stuff. Zero fuel weight means how much does the airplane weigh without fuel? It's pretty much what it wants. Zero fuel weight center of gravity is what is the center of gravity in a percentage. Um, and that the aircraft will use that for calculating its balance. So where do we find that information? Well, if we go back over to our our sim brief and let me 
you just bring that up again. There we go. So we go back over to Simbrief. You can see our zero fuel weight is located here. It's in kilograms. So our zero fuel weight is 52,905 kilograms. And our maximum zero fuel weight for this aircraft is 68,363. So we're under, that is a good thing. So we're gonna enter that in, in the uh, information here. So we, it, you can see how it wants it, three digits. Um, there we go, three digits and then a decimal place, which is fine. We only have two digits, it'll accept that uh, just as well. So our zero uh, fuel weight is 52.9. We then put in the slash, and now it wants the center of gravity. So when you're setting up the airplane in the menus before you load into the airport, when you set in your fuel and your weights, it will tell you what that center of gravity is. And it does not show it on this page, unfortunately. So you have to write it down once you've once you calculate it in there. I have written it down, it's 23.47, so we'll go 23.47. There's the information. We now click on the, the button right here, and it will put it in, and there we go. Now the block fuel. I know the block fuel for the aircraft. I've already pre-worked it out. It's 6,048 kilograms, you know, pretty close to what it says there. So that becomes 6.0. So we'll put that in there. Now this is gonna do some calculations based on our route and all the information it has. So there's our trip fuel, how much time we're gonna be flying, it shows there. Uh, alternate fuel, our final time. Our minimum fuel on board should be 2.1 tons. And we can uh, go check, and we're also carrying an extra uh, 1.8 tons of fuel. Now, one other thing we have to enter in is what's called the trip wind. So if we go back over to our sim brief, you'll see here is a thing called trip wind. What this does is all the waypoints we're going to, it looks at what direction the winds are estimated to be, and it calculates for the entire trip, averaged out over the distance we're flying, what is the effect of the wind. So in this case, it's a T, which means it's a tailwind of 33 knots. So when you look at the entire trip, it's going to be like we've had a little bit of a push from behind at 33 knots for the entire trip. Uh, it can be a headwind, in which case you're fighting the headwind. So with a, with a tailwind trip wind, we'll be a little bit ahead of schedule. With a headwind, we may be a little bit behind. So that's T33. So we're going to come back over to here and we're going to enter T33. And that goes into our trip wind right here. And it changes the calculation slightly. See, we're now down to 2.0 uh, on the fuel, which is all fine. So that's now entered in. So the next thing we're going to do is go to our flight plan. And we're going to enter our departure and arrival information. Departure, we know what we're doing. Arrival, it's a good guess based on the weather currently. So we come up here, we click beside the airport. And then we click departure, and now we get to select the runway we're taking off on. There's two runways in use here at Edinburgh, 06 and 24. Winds are out of the east, so we're going to go off on 06. And the departure we're using is the, let's go to find it here, the GoSam 1D. So there it is. The GOSA 1D, and that is, you can see it here, it lists the ones that are available, but that's the one they want. We want because that is where the route we're taking off and flying down, it's going to take us to that route. So we click on that. Uh, no transition, that's fine. And then we go down here and click on insert. And that puts it in for the calculations. And we do the same thing over here with. Um, 
with um, Gatwick, so this time it's the arrival. We're going to be landing on the ILS for runway 08 right, and that's the first one you can see here. It also gives us the runway uh, length as well, which is very handy. So we're going to click on the first one, and we're arriving on the Dissit 1G arrival. So we're going to scroll. There's the Dissi 1G arrival. We're going to add that in. And are we going via Astra? Let's take a look. We maybe. We'll insert it anyway and we'll take a look when we get closer. So that's in now. So one of the things we can do is we're going to take a look at our approach now. So we'll go into our Navigraph again. So here's the approach. It's the Dissit 1G. We're going to come in at uh, Dissit, fly down to Kidley down to the Midhurst VOR and then we come in around Holly we make that left turn and then we will be vectored in to come in for the runway and you can see here in the center of the cross is where the runway is two things you'll notice on these charts is one flight restrictions uh, for altitude so they're, they're in the blue so here at distant we have to be at flight level 200 which is 20,000 feet at Kidley we have to be at 15,000 feet flight level 150 and it brings us down. Uh, it also provides some other information as well, such as our transition levels and stuff. And then we get the red warnings, like down here at Tolfaz and Holly. Those are speed limits we have to be at. Uh, so these are all things you have to look at in advance. And then the ILS chart for the runway. This is it here. So if you look over here, you can see we go hollow, uh, Holly, and then we come around here to Willow. And then if we go to the actual approach, there's Willow and there's the rest of the approach coming in like this and around and it shows um, that's the initial approach. And I'm going to have to look at the charts. That's the one I want. That's the final approach here. And then once we come in on the runway, it shows us our, our glide slope, where we have to intercept that, and our information about landing clearance and when we have to be able to see the runway and our missed approach, what happens in case we don't make it in, what the procedure is and all that stuff. So that's all there, but that is for a little bit down the road. So we've got all that in throw in one last thing we have to do now is we have to enter our performance information so we are going to enter this in and get the data in so we're ready to, for takeoff so a couple of things we have to enter in here first of all our transition altitude that is when our altimeters go to standard or lights come off uh, and all aircraft are flying the same so that it prevents uh, any conflicts, conflicts in altitude. According to the chart, and they are different for different areas, um, it says we're 6,000 feet, so we're going to type in 6,000 feet and put that into our transition altitude. Thrust reduction altitude and acceleration altitude are where when we take off on full power we then ease back into uh, climb power, which is easier on the engines. Uh, that's set at 1605 feet right now. And uh, I'm going to leave it there. It's usually a thousand feet. 
but that's fine. We can leave it where it is. We'll, we will be good there. Flaps. Flaps will be on setting one for the takeoff. I only ever use flaps two if I'm on a really short runway, like five, four, five thousand feet, maybe six thousand. Anything over there, flaps one should be good. So to flaps one takeoff, there's a slash and stabilizer trim, trim horizontal stabilizer. I've looked it up. For this, it's going to be uh, up trim of 1.1. This is based on our center of gravity setting, and it's to balance the airplane out as we take off. Um, this isn't found within the sim, but you can do Google, Google searches for A320 uh, trim settings, and you can come up with charts that'll show if your center of gravity is this, this is the trim setting you should use. So we're going to put that in there. That's now in. We're going to use a flex temperature of 67 degrees. And that is now in. I'll just clear that message out. So the, what the flex temp is, is when you go to take off power, instead of running full tilt that the engine's going as fast as I can, if you have the runway length that you can accelerate slower, then it will make the adjustment to the engines so that it will do that. And this decreases uh, noise, it decreases wear on the engines, um, your takeoff run might be a bit longer to get up to speed, but you're not overstressing the engines as much. So that's why we're going to use that. Engine out acceleration, if we lose an engine, that's not a concern that we have. So that's good. So what we need now are our V speeds. So what are V speeds? V speeds are on takeoff. These are your three main speeds you need to know. V1, and we'll click the button, is going to be 125 knots. And we'll click it again to put it in there. So that is the speed at which we are going flying. So as we accelerate, if something happens, if a tire bursts, if an engine goes out, if, if we have an electrical failure or whatever, if we are below V1, we still have room on the runway to stop. So if that happens and let's say all, all the panels go dark, we, we lose electrics. If we're under that speed, we can hit the brakes full and we will stop on the runway. Once we're over that speed and before we rotate, um, there's a, there's, we're going to be running off the end of that runway. Um, so if we pass V1, and in bigger airplanes there's a bigger spread to this but if we pass v1 and then something happens um and we hit the brakes we're probably going off into the into the grass the dirt off the end of the runway um so oops in the briefings you'll often hear them say uh if you listen to pilot briefings they'll say you know anything below v1 will stop on the runway uh uh, the pilot will handle uh, the immediate actions, the, the first officer will handle communications. Good. Then they'll say above V1, except for engine failure or some other extremely critical things, um, we, will, uh, we will go to, into the air and deal with the issue. So let's say all the uh, air conditioning units disengaged or something as an example. Um, so if you notice them go out, you're still going to take off and then you'll deal with the issue in the air and if you have to, you'll come back and land. Um, but VR, and we'll click on it, you see a 126, that is the speed we're going to rotate the airplane. And you can see there's only one knot difference in this aircraft. Like I said, different aircraft, you get a wider spread or, wider spread or smaller spread. So VR means rotate. That's when you pull back on the stick and take the airplane into the air. V2, we'll click on that, 130. That is the minimum speed for your climb out. So you do not climb less than that speed, or, or basically you're going to stall and fall out of the air. So once we enter that information in there, it is transferred over into the system. And you can see here it shows a magenta. That is our uh, climb speed. It is already set. Minimum climb speed is set. And it's all good. So that is everything entered into the system.
and usually, obviously, if you're not explaining, it would go a lot faster. You can see the Adiris have now aligned, and everything, it, the nav display is now up. So we can go in, and, and going into plan mode and setting a 40 mile range, we can then go down into the bottom unit here, and clicking on the, f the flight plan or F plan button, we can bring up the flight plan, and then using the arrow keys, we can kind of go through our flight where we come out, head west, and then down through Scotland and England, down towards um, Gatwick, and you can see as we showed on the chart that little come in and the S turn and into the runway. So everything is looking very, very good. So we've checked the weather, we've done flight services. Uh, at this point, we would uh, make check for ice on the wings. We don't have ice on the wings. We check for our uh, get our clearance from clearance delivery so that our flight plan is activated and everything is up and running and everything is good. So at this point, a few last things to do is we come down and set up our transponder. So our transponder is over here. And it is uh, located right here. And this is, this. let me, go, let me so that doesn't come up. This is what sends out our signal um, to ATC to, to let them know who we are. So when you're flying IFR, instrument flight rules, like the airliners do, they give you a code, and this code we've typed in. So let's say I'll use my flight number, uh, 5556. So I put 5556 in the box, as I call it. So on the ATC displays, you will, we would show up with that number uh, identifying us. And that would be tagged to our flight plan so they can quickly cross-reference who we are. Couple settings here. Um, we have the transponder, which is here. So we have a couple modes. Um, the top dial currently functions. So it's on standby right now, which means it's just warmed up and waiting. You can set it to auto, uh, or I turn it all the way to on. And turning it on means it's broadcasting, and uh, it's identifying the aircraft. I'll leave it on standby at the moment. Some airports want you to have it on when you're taxiing because they track you around the airport like that. Uh, others, you don't because it just gets a confused blob of signals at the airport on the radar. The other thing we have over here is what's called TCAS. And you can see that little group of dials over here. TCAS is Traffic Collision Avoidance System. So there's a couple settings here. The one on the right is uh, the standby uh, TA and RA. Um, TA, I believe, is threats, and RA is reactions. Usually, put it on TA RA. It's the mo It's the the higher level of the two. And then next to it, you've got um, a selector, so you can go threat. So it'll only show aircraft that are a threat to you. So anyone that's within a couple miles and coming your way type of deal. You have uh, the next one is all, so it will show everything, which in a real airplane can get kind of cluttered on the screen. And then you've got above and below, which is great because if you're climbing, you want to know what's above you, and when you're descending, you want to know what's below you. So in the climb, you set it for above, it'll only show what's above you as you climb up to altitude. And when you're descending, you set it to below, so it'll show what's going down. And then when you're in the air, you might set it to all or th just threat uh, when you're in cruise. And that's the TCAS system. So we will uh, turn that on um, before we depart. And what else do we have? So we're getting ready to go. We'll do the final overhead panel check. There's a couple last things we have to do. So we scan, do a final scan down the panel. As we come down, we'll notice a couple things. Crew oxygen supply. We'll turn that on so that the crew has their oxygen ready for them. Keep scanning down. Fuel pumps will wait. That's fine. Uh, air system, we'll turn that up for when we disconnect. We get the air going in the back. So these are the cockpit and cabin temperature gauges. We'll, I usually just set up about 12 o'clock. 
and we come down, we come down, and over here we have the emergency exit lights. Off, arm it on. We want to arm the emergency exit lights, and they are now armed. We'll now come down to the flight management computer here. This is our autopilot. Uh, if we go back and we look at our departure, and I'll bring it up again. So if we look at our departure, we're going to be taking off out of Gatwick. You can see the purple arrow where we are. So we're going to be taking off to the right. We're going to loop around to the north, and you can start seeing altitude restrictions. So our first altitude restriction is over 5,000 feet, under 6,000 feet. And then it's 6,000 feet at Gao, and then we fly out and down at GoSam at 6,000 feet, and then we're released en route at GoSam. So we've got a 6,000 foot restriction. That can be overridden by ATC, uh, but we're not flying ATC, so we are gonna fly the published approach. If you are flying on VATSIM, and there is no ATC online, it is expected that you are flying the published approaches. So if you are departing from an airport, if you're going into an airport, other traffic are going to be expecting you following whatever approach and procedures that you are on. So if you look at London, with London Gatwick, London uh, Heathrow, London Stansted, London City, uh, Bluton, um, that's a lot of airports and there's some very specific procedures to keep the airplanes that are coming into the London area separate from the airplanes that are going out. So if you decide to do your own thing, you could be flying right in through other airplanes and uh, it causes a bit of a mess. Um, so always fly the published procedure unless directed otherwise by ATC. But we have that, we know where we're going there and it is all good. Alright, so we'll get rid of uh, that. So the beacon light can come on and that will let them know we're getting ready here and uh, as part of the immersion I let them know uh, on the ground as well just so that they are aware. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead, flight deck. We will be ready shortly. Okay, I will hold. There we go. So, emergency lights. We've done it. They're armed. FMC is set up. 6,000 feet is entered. Departure briefing, we've covered it. It's all good to go. Doors, we are all done. Everybody is loaded in. We heard them say what they had to say. So we're gonna come down here and we're gonna lock the cabin door. There we go, cabin door is now locked and nobody can get in. And this is where we're gonna leave it at this point. That is my cockpit preparation done and we are ready to go flying. So in the next video, we're gonna do the pushback engine start and uh, probably the taxi out to uh, the runway. And then after that, we'll carry on with our flight down to Gatwick. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something. If you do have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you like what I'm doing here, hit the subscribe button, bell for notifications. I live stream on the weekends. And I appreciate you spending some time with us here today. Till the next one, bye for now.